and I want to start by asking you a simple but complex question. What do you do when your now isn't the now your later had in mind? What do you do when your right now is not the right now that your later on was expecting? Here's what I mean by that question. We all have things in our life, hopes, dreams, ideal outcomes, projects, relationships, all of these things, and we have a picture in our head of what that is going to look like. And that is going to require a series of right nows, a series of moments that lead to that, right? You're, this is called strategy, right? You gotta back up a little bit and go, okay, this has to happen, this has to happen, this has to happen, this has to happen. And then life happens. Something doesn't go according to plan. Something doesn't go the way you drew it up. All of a sudden, your right now is going to lead to a different later than you planned on. The unexpected pops up. The thing you didn't calculate for. The person that is always a wild card does what wild cards do. Well, what do you do? How do you respond? And is there anything remotely spiritual about how we respond or Christian about how we respond? Does it even matter how we respond? Now, the best way that I can help you kind of think through this is to give you an example from my own life when my now was not the now that my later had in mind, and it has to do with a trip I took to Germany. Every once in a while, I get to go do some public speaking for other organizations in other contexts. And this one was to go speak to some very high-ranking CEO-level officials for a very famous pharmaceutical company that you would know, had I named it. And I, they invited me to go to their Germany location to do some training on how to connect with other people that you work with better. And so I decided that I would just book the flight to get there early, which meant I'd need to preach here, do the talk here at Great Lakes, and then go to O'Hare Airport and get on an airplane um, and travel. So I booked the flight, and this flight was on a Sunday, like I said, in December. And if you were around back in December, you know that we were doing a Christmas series back then. And the Christmas series had to do with famous Christmas movies. And we were pulling ideas from those movies and talking about them. And the first week of that series was Charlie Brown. And I wore this shirt. Now here's why this is important. Because this is what I wore to the airport. <laughs> I just didn't have time to change. And so I got in the car, I drove to the airport, I park, I go, I check in, I get on the airplane. It's one of these big mamma jammas that flies over the ocean. It's a huge, huge plane. I get in my seat, I had, you know, checked my bag, got my stuff, all the things. The plane starts to back up and suddenly stops because it had hit a light. I don't know why they have lights in the middle of runways at airports. I mean, I know why, but the plane wasn't supposed to hit it, and it stopped, and we were stopped for a very long time. So long, in fact, that I was never going to make my connection in London to Frankfurt, Germany. We fly, we land, we walk off the airplane, and what was amazing is they are handing us new boarding passes as we go. And I just said, okay, how, how fast and far do I have to run to get there? And she goes, good news, sir. You don't have to run very far or at all because you don't leave for five hours. I said, well, I guess I'll just go see London. Sir, we're going to ask that you don't leave because if you miss this next flight, you're not going to make it to Frankfurt. That was not going to work for me. So I decided I'll stay and just walk around London Heathrow Airport, which meant eat a lot of fast food and sleep in weird places and all that kind of stuff. I finally get on the plane to get to Frankfurt, and it's delayed. And I land eventually, by God's grace, in Frankfurt. I get off the plane. I go down to claim my luggage and there is no luggage to claim. It is gone. <laughs> this is all I got. This is what I will have to wear in front of executives for a major pharmaceutical company in less than eight hours. 
And I was faced with a dilemma. What am I going to do? That later is not going to work for me. But this right now is not the now that that later had in mind. The one that I had pictured, this was, nothing was going according to plan. Because I'm the knucklehead that not only puts my clothes in a checked bag, I put everything in a checked bag. Who wants to carry that around an airport? I didn't have a toothbrush, I didn't have a razor, I didn't have deodorant, I didn't have anything. And I am in Germany where they do not speak a lot of English, and they use a currency that I don't have, and I'm in the middle of the city that I don't know. And I'm faced with, what am I going to do? How am I going to respond? And so I get in my ride that's going to take me from the airport, and I said, sir, is there by any chance a, a department store close by the airport where I could go buy some at least business casual clothes? Uh, and he goes, yes, sir, there is, but uh, you're going to have a hard time finding your size <laughs> at that place. So anything was better than this. So I went and I found clothes probably way too small for me and, I, it, and, it, and it worked out. It worked out. But those moments are really difficult because the natural reaction is to freak out, is to panic, is to get angry, and maybe I'm just talking about me, but that, that's the knee-jerk kind of thing, right? When you get stuck there and you're like, this is messing up everything. What do we do? And, and I found myself really, I mean, I know this sounds a little bit cheesy, but I really, I stood there and I went, well, how, how would Jesus do this? Because last time I looked in Luke 5, 17, it didn't talk about when Jesus lost luggage. So I was really like, I don't know what Jesus would do. But all I can do is take it one little step at a time. Did I do it perfect? No. But did I make it? Yeah. So what's the unexpected thing for you? Uh, it could be something as simple as you got up in the morning, you had your cup of coffee, you looked at your day and you went, oh, today's the day. I'm knocking out this project. I'm going to get this thing done. I'm going to have this meeting. It's going to end on time. Everything is going to be amazing when I walk out the door to come home. And then you get there and your boss goes, good news, we're having a staff meeting. It's going to last five hours. Cancel everything. Some stuff goes off in you. Or you're going to have a day where you're not going to have to do anything. You're going to get to relax. You're going to get to watch TV. You're going to get to eat your favorite kind of Doritos. And you're going to get to just do a you day. And then your kid gets sick. And there's no you anymore in the day. It could be, this is the relationship I'm going to have when I'm old and gray. And something happens today that destroys that tomorrow. What do you do in those situations, and how do you respond? The answer might be a little simpler than you think, and so I want to share with you a little bit of a guy's life who you could label as a life unexpected. The life that a guy named Elisha lived was not one that he planned on. It was not one he was anticipating. And it certainly was not one that he would have even dreamed of when he was a little kid. But Elisha's story actually begins with a guy named Elijah. Kind of cool, their names rhyme, and they became friends. But Elijah was the prophet. I mean, he was God's man. And he was in charge of going into kind of hostile situations and telling people that we're far from God, you better get close to God or he's not going to be happy with you and you got to change your ways and all these things. He, I mean, he, he was a little bit of a big deal. And by a little bit, I mean a really big deal. Such a big deal that fast forward to Jesus' life, a lot of times they thought that Jesus was Elijah come back to life. So Elijah is the guy, in case you don't know, he's the guy that called fire down from heaven. He prayed, God sent fire and it burned up the altar. And if ever you've been looking for a reason to crack open the Bible, this story is it. I encourage you to go look up 1 Kings and read through this. Um, it's an amazing story. It's actually one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture um, where God just shows up and embarrasses these other pagan gods, by what he does. And Elijah was part of it. And then Elijah runs off, and he's super depressed. 
if you've ever wondered, like, does God actually understand where I'm at with the depression that I'm feeling? Read Elijah's story. He, he gets so depressed that he actually says to God, I want to die. And I read that and I'm like, how could you be so depressed? You just saw the most amazing thing happen ever. He said, God, I want to die. God whispers to him and says, I got more for you. I got some things that you still are going to do. There's, there's still good in your life that I want you to experience and be part of what I'm doing in the world that's good. And so he gets Elijah up and gets him running off. And that's where we're going to jump into the story where God's starting to give Elijah his, his marching orders for what is next. But it's not, it's not what Elijah had in mind. So we jump in 1 Kings chapter 19. Then the Lord told him, told Elijah, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be king of Aram, then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel-Maholah, to replace you as my prophet. Wait a minute, so did you just say you want me to find my replacement? I tried retiring. You told me no. I tried being done. You told me no. You want me to go replace my... Self, and by the way, did you say go back the way you came? Do you know what I've been through to get here? Sometimes our right now feels like before. And most of us worked really hard to get away from before. Most of us scrimped and scraped and fought and survived. And we got to this now, and we don't want to go backwards. And a lot of the times where internally we're feeling triggered, it's usually because something going on right now reminds us of something that went on before. And so when God says to Elijah, I want you to go back the way you came, I'm guessing that was not easy for Elijah to hear. And he says, I want you to go anoint all of these people and, and institute some change. Now understand, when, when God says, I want you to anoint them, we don't use those words a whole lot. Essentially, it means, I want you to go divinely appoint them. Remember, Elijah is God's man. So for people, when Elijah spoke, it was as if God himself were speaking. So if Elijah rolls into town and says, Jehu, you're king, everybody's like, all right, that's what God says. Elisha, you're the next prophet. Okay, that, that's what God says, right? Because that's how powerful he is. And Elijah had to have been going, this doesn't make any sense. I tried being done, you've called me back in, and all you're calling me to do is get other people in place. But what Elijah eventually comes to understand God's doing is God is playing a strategy game. God is thinking about later, and he knows that there are a set of nows that have to be in place in order for that later to become a reality. The things that led you here Today, this moment, were particular. If any of those particular variables were even slightly different, you would not be here. There would be some other end result for you because you headed down a different path. You went in a different direction. You didn't accept this right now because it didn't match up with your later. And sometimes God goes, I got a later for you. You're not going to understand it. It's not going to make sense. It's going to feel kind of messy. But know, know this, that that later is better than this now, and it's better than that before. But will you trust me? That's the hardest question to answer. Now, what happens next is just so fascinating to me because Elijah does what God's asked him to do, and he shows up in Elisha's backyard. Now imagine for a minute, if you were out yesterday afternoon cutting the grass in your backyard, and one of the most famous people in all of the world, you fill in the blank who that is, walks into your backyard. That is a weird moment. Like, what are you doing here? And this is what happens. Elijah walks in to Elisha's backyard while Elisha is essentially doing yard work. 
This is what we read. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. And if you're like me, you read that and you go, that's a lot of detail. Why the detail? And I'm convinced it's for this reason, to help us understand that Elisha's later is his now. Back in the day, you didn't get 12 teams of oxen by chance. You worked really hard. You were a business savvy person. What's not explicit in this text is that Elisha has a family business on his hands. This has, this has been put together. And his later is kind of set in stone. This is what he's going to do. If you've ever been part of a family that has a family business, you know the pressure of one day this will all be yours. And one day you're going to be in charge. And one day you're going to do these things that are going to provide for other people. I don't imagine Elisha pushing the oxen around. Well, he's not pushing any oxen. He's walking behind them, right? And I don't imagine him going, someday I'm going to be a prophet. He didn't grow up a little boy like, one day I hope that Elijah comes to my house and pulls me out. No, he's going, this is my business. This is my lot in life. This is my tomorrow. This is my later. I don't even got to think about right now because it's all lined up. Elisha kind of knew who he was at this point. His things are kind of set. And for a lot of us, we at least feel like we know who we are. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes we like that. Oftentimes we don't. We may not have a family business, but we got a family trait, we got a family history. And a lot of times we feel like that has locked us in to not just a day, but a long set of days. It's our future. It's who we are. But we can't help it. Some of us feel stuck in our job. We feel stuck in our relationships. You name it. There's this idea that this defines us. And I don't even... My later is now. There's, there's not really any hope. There's not really any horizon. There's not really any promise. I'm just going to survive and make it through. But Elijah doesn't just peek around the corner and wave at Elisha. He does something that radically turns Elisha's perspective and understanding of everything upside down. And it's not what you think. It's kind of weird. This is what we read. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. (laughs) Again, like you're in the backyard pushing the lawnmower. Somebody powerful and famous walks in. They throw their jacket over your shoulder and see you later and walk off. (laughs) Like this is so strange. And how, how does Elisha compute this? Understand what this means though. For us, it has no meaning in our culture. But in that culture, that was Elijah saying, Elisha, follow me. You're going to become my student. You're going to become my assistant. You're going to become my apprentice. He was taking his cloak of power and he was throwing it over Elisha's shoulders saying, you are chosen. Now here's what's powerful about this moment. It's not what Elisha thought. It's not what he was envisioning. We have no record. We have no reason to think that at any point in his life, he was counting down to the day Elijah shows up. It just kind of happened. It was unexpected. It was out of the blue. But this invitation radically changes not just today, not just his now, but his later too. All of a sudden, when, you're, when your later changes, your now instantly shifts. When where you're headed is different than where you started off for, all of a sudden, you've got to kind of change direction. Because again, all these nows lead to a certain later. And Elijah has just walked into Elisha's life and said, hey, we're not worrying about cattle anymore. 
We're not worrying about fields anymore. You're with me. Imagine this. In a sense, God's stepping into your life going, hey, uh, throw out your plans. I got a whole new thing. And Elisha does what I would have done. Probably what you would have done. He responds this way. Uh, He leaves his oxen standing there. He ran after Elijah and he said to him, first, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye and, and then I'll go with you. Elijah replied, go on back, but think about what I've done to you. In other words, you can go to your before, but that's your before. Your now has just become your before. It's a new now, and there's going to be a new later. So you can go and let go of that. You can go and say goodbye to that. You can go and say, this chapter of my life has closed, but make no mistake, that's not the end. I I want you to think about that God is rearranging your life in a way that you did not imagine, in a way that you could not explain. And you're being invited to, in a sense, abandon today. Abandon this hope and dream and future. And at first that feels like a difficult ask, right? Like it it feels like God is crushing our dreams. But again, the promise, if you remember from last week, is always our best now is lead to better laters. And here Elijah steps in and he goes, I'm going to ask you to abandon your later for a better one. And everybody around Elisha was going, this is reckless. This is reckless. Like, you're just going to leave your source of income? You're just going to pack up and go? I mean, have you met Elijah? He's kind of crazy. And you're going to follow him? You're you're not even going to act like this is a big deal? It reminds me of when Jesus goes to call his first disciples and he walks up to them and they're in their boats fishing, doing what makes them money, and he goes, hey, follow me. And Peter and Andrew and James and John are like, "Mm, okay. And they go. And, you know, for James and John, their dad's literally sitting in the boat, the dad that worked to get the boat and get the business and get all the stuff. And he had to be going, where are you going? Do you know all I've given you? Do you know the later I've put together for you? You're going to go follow the crazy rabbi from Nazareth? Now, Elisha is not just going. He's never coming back. Listen to what he does next. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. I just picture as as Elisha is getting ready to do all this that he just did, somebody had to go, wait a minute. What if this doesn't work out? What if the Elijah thing doesn't work out and you need to come back to work? You can't kill the thing that makes you money. You can't burn the things that the thing that makes you money uses to make you money. And you're not even going to sell the meat? Have you seen where that dude sleeps? You're going to want hotel money. Everybody's going, you are insane. This is the moment, like with, I didn't know this in first service, so I had to ask. Um, Cortez says, burn the boats. We're not going back. The later for Elisha is so compelling that he radically rearranges his right now and says, whatever it takes to get to that thing that I feel God has called me to, I am committed to it. I'm ready to jump. And if you've ever like done cliff jumping or bridge jumping or any of this into water, you know that this takes a huge leap of faith. But once you're off that, there's no turning back. And that's what Elisha does. I'm jumping. I'm not coming back. His now is now all about that later. 
And it doesn't mean that his before wasn't good. It doesn't mean that his before isn't a part of his story. It certainly is. We've talked about it. But that later is so compelling. And even though it felt reckless to everybody else in his life, and fast forward to the disciples, their decisions felt reckless to everybody in their life. They understood something that I'm trying to learn. It's this idea. You're responsible for now. God's responsible for later. All of them take a moment reflex. There's not any point along the line where they go, okay, and what is the plan, Elijah? What is the plan, Jesus? They just go in this moment, they respond in this moment, and they trust that whatever that later is going to be, God will line it up and get them there. And you go, that's easy for prophets. (laughs) That's easy for disciples. That's easy for people that are in the Bible thousands of years ago. That is not the same as me and my job and my family and my decisions It's easy for somebody like me to stand up here and go, you're just responsible for right now and live in the moment and it's all great. I get it. But this is where faith and trust play such a huge role in any relationship with God. Where we have to go, I'm a little freaked out and I'm a little scared. And by the way, in case nobody has ever told you this, you don't have to be brave to follow God. You don't have to be courageous. You just have to be faithful. You just have to take one step at a time. What is the next thing that God's calling me to or inviting me to right now? Let him worry about later. He's got big arms, big hands, and big plans. And he can take care of it. The question you're probably asking, because it's the one I ask, is how do I know it's him making the invitation and not some crazy manifestation in my head, right? Because we have a habit, especially Christians, if you're here today and you you would not call yourself a Christian, one, thank you for being here, um, and thanks for letting us be part of your weekend. We're glad you're here. Um, You've probably seen this in other Christians, though. We, We have this tendency to go, well, God told me. And we think that that means we can do whatever we want. Because we can just say, God told me to do this. Well, sometimes, do you ever see this where God tells somebody to do something? And I'm like, I don't think God told you to do that. (laughs) And I really love when people come up to me and they're like, hey, God is telling you. And I'm like, funny, he didn't just tell me straight up. (laughs) We weaponize it in some ways. So how do we know, and how do we make sure we're not just justifying our actions by slapping God told me on it? I've come up with three questions that I'm going to share with you so that maybe you can use them to kind of test that out and figure out, is this God inviting me to radically change my now and trust him with my later? First question, what am I actually losing? Like, what is it that if I make this choice and I follow what I feel like God is directing me to do. If I, what am I actually losing? Most of the time, what's going to fall into the loss category are things that can be replaced, are, are things, maybe a, a vacation, so a place. But in the end, you realize, I'm not actually losing the things that matter most to me. When I'm standing in Frankfurt, Germany, and there is no luggage with my name on it coming through, I started wrestling with, okay, how did Jesus do this? I think first question is, what am I actually losing? And my answer was, nothing. I don't even like wearing suits. So if I lose that, I don't care. (laughs) Toothbrushes are not that expensive. What I knew in that moment was the, the people that matter most to me are healthy and safe and good. I'm not actually losing a whole lot. It's just stuff. Plus, I got a funky shirt that'll make for a great story. And I know there are bigger things in life where we have to wrestle with that question and that answer may not be as simple. 
But I think the more and more you wrestle with it, the more and more you start to go, I don't know that I'm giving up a whole lot, really, to do this thing that has eternal significance, that has God-sized significance. The second question I ask is, who's actually gaining by me doing this thing? And here's the secret. If the answer to that question is you, rethink. It, because I'm convinced, in my experience, God is rarely, if ever, going to be like, I want you to do something that's going to make you awesome. That's going to bless you. More often than not, God is going to invite me to do things that are going to bless others. And in so doing, he's asking me to trust that he's inviting someone else to bless me. And I don't, I don't have to worry about me. I just worry about others. So who is gaining? Who will benefit? For me in this moment, it was, who's going to benefit from me responding well to this situation? It's not me. It's the people that work on the counter on the other side. It's the story I'll tell my kids when I go home. It's when I'll share this with Great Lakes and so on and so forth, which is actually the third question. When this is just a story I'm telling, which one do I want to tell? Because you know what story I didn't want to tell? I marched right over to that counter and I pointed my finger in that poor little German girl's face and I told her, what for? And I demanded free drinks on my next flight and you know, they gave me a voucher for 500 and that wasn't even enough and I'm calling the president of British Airways and blah, 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 blah. Is that the story? I mean, who wants to be that person? Not me. Did I want to go home and tell my kids I lost my luggage and I freaked out in the middle of the place? I curled up in the fetal position and cried myself to sleep. <laughs> That's not the story. Do I want to tell the story like, hey, I believe in this God that gives me patience and peace and joy and love and all these kinds of things, but I, didn't, I ignored all of that. And what I wanted to tell my kids and tell you is that I responded differently than I ever have before, and you know what? It was great. I walked up to that little German girl who, it was not her fault. She apologized profusely. I said, it's no big deal. It's just stuff. And she looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> the, the thing that I learned in this moment, responding differently than what felt natural, was this. If you know you're now, there's now no need knowing you're later now. <laughs> It makes total sense. Let me read it again. If you know you're now, there's now no need knowing you're later now. In this moment, I was able to go, okay, this is, this is it. God has given me this opportunity, lost luggage in a foreign country with nothing but a stupid Charlie Brown shirt. Doesn't matter what's later because this is now. I was able to let go of picturing myself in a nice suit in front of all these executives and all this stuff. So I've, I go out and I find the clothes and I do the thing and it was all fine and nobody cared. I didn't lose anything. They hopefully gained something and I've had a really fun story to tell ever since. For us as a church, when it comes to this project that we introduced a couple weeks ago and have been talking about, this new auditorium and lobby, if you haven't been here, I encourage you to go online. We've got a whole page dedicated to it. Just look at four now. And by the way, a lot of you have asked, like, where is it actually going? You've shown maps and pictures, but I don't really understand. If you go out the, the north doors, you're going to walk across some pavement. When your toes hit grass, that's where the new auditorium is going to be. It's literally right, right there. Um, the questions get asked here, too, like, what are we actually losing, really? We, we, we are going to have to spend a little money to make it happen. And we've asked you to help us with that. And if you brought your card, by the way, you can drop it in one of the giving stations. If you need one, you can get it at Next Steps. Um, there's going to be a financial cost, but in the end, what's that in the scope of eternal significance? And who's the gain? It isn't you. You already got a chair. It's for everybody you're going to invite to sit with you. I was sitting right down here singing, and I thank you for sitting in the front row. I love you guys for sitting up here. Um, wh what was funny was I watched. Somebody came in, and they were, like, trying to figure out, do we have enough seats here? <laughs> right? Like, we got to get to the place where everybody that comes in and we've invited 
has a seat, and they never have to wonder. And what's the story we're going to tell? Here's the story we're going to tell. This church, this community of people, and their God puts people first every single time. They put me first, they put my family first, they put my friends first, and they never look back. Because we believe that we're responsible for now, and he's responsible for later. So one of the questions a lot of people have asked me is like, well, so what are we doing with the land? When are we going to build there? And they don't love my answer. I don't know. But we're going to, right? I don't know. I'm only responsible for right now. I trust him with whatever's later. And we'll respond when that later is our now. You know, you never asked if I got my luggage back, by the way. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> I didn't get it at all when I was in Germany. I was there for a whole week. Never came. Charlie Brown, polo shirt, khakis. That's all I, that's all I wore for a whole week. I got home, one week passed, no luggage. Another week passed, no luggage. And I just started thinking, next time I see my luggage, we'll be from an airplane watching it float across the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> but one Saturday morning, my phone started ringing at 4 a.m. Now, my phone only rings at 4 a.m. for five reasons. Child one, two, three, or four, or you repeatedly call me. Don't get any ideas. But my... So it's ringing, and it's a Chicago number, and I'm like, oh my gosh, my son went down to the city, he's in trouble, I better answer this. Hello. That's exactly how I answered. I'm not a 4 a.m. person. Hello. Mr. Peterson. <laughs> yes. This is Hector from British Airways. <laughs> Hi, Hector. Good news, I have your luggage. <laughs> I said... You do? Well, where? I'm at your front door. <laughs> I said, Hector, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yes, sir, I'm really glad you were awake. <laughs> Better later. Better later. Better story. Couldn't have happened if something didn't get in the way. And eventually what I wanted came back. And I don't know if they were totally related or not, but I, I was able to show up faithfully in the moment. And it worked out in the end. Let's pray. God, you're good, better than we deserve. And we are grateful to be a part of this and um, a part of this church and a part of this project. And we believe that whatever the later is you have in mind is going to be amazing because you're you. Help us to be faithful in this moment right now. As individuals in the moments that you call us to disrupt and turn upside down and maybe even abandon a later that, that we had in mind for a better one that you do, help us to respond now. Uh, and give you our best in this moment, like Elisha did, like the, the disciples did when you called them to move. You're the best. Thanks for loving us. Amen.